Hello there, everybody. Today, I'm going to go over carotid duplex examination. Stroke is one of the leading causes of death in the world, and the carotid duplex exam is very important in evaluating atherosclerotic disease. It is usually one of the first exams ordered on patients. In this video, I'm going to go over the anatomy of the extracranial arteries. I'm going to go over the protocol of the duplex examination and briefly cover pathology at the end. Common indications for carotid duplex is syncope, stroke, altermental status, transient ischemic attacks, bruies, and follow-up for known stenosis. The brain is fed oxygenated blood by four main vessels, which have a common origin at the aortic arch. The typical configuration of the aortic arch consists of three vessels, the right brachiocephalic, which is also called the inanimate, which uh, bifurcates into right subclavian and right common carotid artery, the left common carotid artery, and the left subclavian artery. There are variations to this anatomy, though 73% of the population has this configuration. The common carotid arteries further bifurcate into internal and external carotid arteries at the carotid bulb, which feed the brain and the face respectively. The vertebral arteries arise from the subclavian artery and traverse cephalid through the transverse foramina of the cervical vertebrae C1 through C6, entering the brain through the posterior fossa. The confluence of all these vessels join to make the circle of Willis a circular anastomotic arterial network at the base of the brain. The walls of an artery are very much like a vein, and they consist of three layers, the tunica interna, tunica media, and tunica adventitia, or the inner, middle, and outer layers. The difference being that the middle muscular layer of the arteries are thicker. This is important to know because this is where plaque builds up. Flow characteristics in normal arteries are described as laminar, which means that the blood cells move parallel to the vessel walls, and they move faster at the center of the stream than they do at the wall. The reason for the slower flow near the wall is because of friction. Laminar flow is also called parabolic flow. Flow through the common carotid artery is usually laminar, though it is not true of the bulb and in cases of tortuous vessels, which can cause turbulent flow. As far as spectral Doppler is concerned, there is a difference of pulsatility depending on what vessel is being interrogated. The common carotid artery has a sharp upstroke and a decent amount of diastolic flow. The internal carotid artery has a broad upstroke and a considerable amount of diastolic flow. And the external carotid artery has a very sharp upstroke and can have little to no diastolic flow or even reversal of flow. Here we're going to go over some techniques that are uh, essential for optimization of the imaging. Um, one is beam steering. Uh, beam steering needs to be done in the direction that allows for the smallest angles of incidence to the blood flow. Another thing to consider is scale or uh, pulse repetition frequency for both color and spectrodoppler. The PRF can be lowered to um, optimize for color filling in uh, slower flowed vessels, and you can raise the PRF in higher velocities to uh, avoid or reduce aliasing. Um, along with wall filter and baseline, you will use these to optimize your imaging. Spectrodoppler angle should be 45 to 60 degrees in order to uh, avoid overestimating the velocities. The ICA-CCA ratio is important for estimating stenosis. With the ICA-CCA ratio, you get the peak systolic velocity of the ICA and the peak systolic velocity of the CCA and divide them. A ICA-CCA ratio of less than 2.0 is considered within the normal range. It is an estimate of at least less than 50% stenosis, which can be described as no hemodynamically significant stenosis. According to the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine, uh, you should, um, at minimum, image the common carotid artery, internal carotid artery, external carotid artery, the bulb, and vertebral arteries. Uh, protocols can vary from place to place, uh, but most places will follow these guidelines. Some places will add some more imaging according to what their needs are. Also, if you do find pathology, you have to take further images to evaluate for that. So for the normal protocol, we begin with the, the common carotid artery proximal. Take a picture in transverse, grayscale, and color Doppler. And then in sagittal, you want to take a grayscale image, one with color and one with spectral Doppler, and measuring the peak systolic and end diastolic velocities. You want to repeat that for the distal carotid artery. At the bulb, you just take transverse and sagittal with and without color. Some places do spectral wave Doppler on that, others don't, because the flow there can be pretty turbulent. After the bulb, you want to take pictures of the bifurcation in transverse and sagittal. Now, for the bifurcation, on some people, it is very difficult 
to get that beautiful image that we all want to get. Um, sometimes if you angle your transducer all the way to the posterior part of the neck and then pivot and angle your beam towards the anterior part of the neck, you might be able to get the, the, the bifurcation that way. Other people, you can get the bi bifurcation just being perfectly sagittal right at the, at the bulb and bifurcation area. After you get the bifurcation, you want to get the internal carotid artery in transverse and sagittal with color and spectral Doppler tracings. While scanning, be sure to document any plaque or pathology seen. You'll also want to repeat these steps for the mid and distal internal carotid artery. This may vary from institution to institution. And then finally, you want to take images of the vertebral artery in sagittal with grayscale, color, and spectral Doppler tracings. Be sure to document that the flow in the vertebral artery is going towards the brain or cephalid, just like the common carotid artery. Now, while scanning, some people have a hard time uh, differentiating between internal and external carotid artery. Well, there's usually a few tips. Uh, while you went, once you reach the bulb, you'll and if you do have a good image of the bifurcation, um, right after the bulb, the the internal carotid artery is usually a little larger in diameter than the external carotid artery though they usually do taper down and become pretty equal. The internal carotid artery is usually away from the face and the external carotid artery is towards the face. So if you're scanning above the bulb and you have one vessel, rock your transducer back and forth. If you go towards the face and a new vessel emerges, that will be the external carotid artery. If you go away from the face and a new vessel emerges, that's the internal carotid artery. Also, the external carotid artery has proximal branches like branches that go to feed the thyroid. Another thing to consider is the waveforms. Usually the internal carotid artery, as I said before, has a lot of diastolic flow, whereas the external carotid artery has less flow. Though in some people, they can have considerable amount of diastolic flow. And one thing that's always top is temporal tap. I myself use would use this as a last ditch effort to identify the external carotid artery because there, there's many easier ways. Um, however, if you're having a really difficult time, you can find the vessel that you think is the external carotid artery, put color and spectral Doppler on it, and as it's tracing the spectral waveform, locate the temporal artery and lightly tap on it. You will see little undulations in the waveform, and that's a temporal tap. If you do this to the internal carotid artery, it won't happen. Some people also have trouble locating the vertebral artery, especially in patients with much bigger necks where the artery is much deeper. Uh, one thing you can do is locate the common, common carotid artery, and once you're sagittal on it, wrote, um, angle your transducer away laterally, and you will encounter a vessel that appears to be segmented. You'll have color, and then drop out, and then color, and then drop out. That's the, the, the artery going through the vertebral foramina. If you're still having trouble, you can have the patient rotate their head more and try to locate at the base where the foramen magnum is the basilar artery, and if you angle down, you'll see the paired vertebral arteries. Uh, this technique is used mostly for a transcranial Doppler, but it's come in handy a couple times for patients with really difficult vertebral arteries. A few things to consider when scanning uh, plaques uh, is their appearance. You want to differentiate whether the surface is smooth or irregular, and you also, you also want to pay attention to the texture. If it's homogeneous, which is usually just a, a fatty plaque, or heterogeneous, which is usually uh, can contain calcium. You also want to keep an eye out to see if you see any intraplaque hemorrhage or ulceration. When these plaques become large enough, ultrasound can be used to assess the degree of, of stenosis. Uh, we use spectral Doppler and color Doppler. Uh, with spectral Doppler, you'll see increased wave, uh, increased velocities. You'll also see waveform changes. You'll have uh, turbulence, spectral broadening, um, tardis parvus waveforms, uh, distal to the stenosis. And of, of course, if the if stenosis doesn't become severe enough, you'll have zero flow. With color Doppler, you'll have aliasing uh, or a color, color mosaic pattern, uh, trickle or absent flow in the case of a complete occlusion. And here is a chart uh, showing the stenosis criteria for the Society of Radiologists and Ultrasounds. Uh, a normal exam is considered a peak systolic velocity of less than 125 centimeters per second, no plaque, uh, and uh, ICA CCA ratio less than 2.0. A 50 to 69 percent stenosis is considered an ICA peak systolic velocity of 125 to 230 centimeters per second, a plaque percentage estimate of 50 percent or more, and, uh, and ICA-CCA ratio in the range of 2 to 4. 
A greater than 70% stenosis is considered when the velocity is higher than 237 centimeters per second. The plaque estimate is greater than 50%, and the ICA-CCA ratio is greater than 4. Once you start reaching levels of near occlusion or total occlusion, these parameters cannot be used to, uh, to find out the degree of stenosis because there may be no flow or the trickle flow will have no Doppler spectra. Other interesting, though much less common pathologies of the carotid are dissection. This is when there's a tear in the layers of the arterial wall, which allows blood to pool in between them and causes a flap. This increased turbulence of flow can, uh, can create blood clots, which can then embolize and cause strokes. Another interesting pathology would be a carotid body tumor. Well, these are tumors that form at the bifurcation of the carotid artery. They're also called paragangliomas. They represent about 65% of head and neck paragangliomas. Another rare pathology is fibromuscular dysplasia. This is a disease process that affects the medium and large arteries of young to middle-aged women. And on imaging, it usually has the string of pearls or string of beads appearance, which is described as a series of lumen stenoses and aneurysmal outpouchings. Lastly, we'll go over Takayasu's arteritis, which is another rare, which is another rare vasculopathy. Um, this is an inflammation of the arteries, uh, usually of the large vessels from branching off of the aorta. And it is described as a granulomatose inflammation of the aorta and its major branches. Um, these thickenings of the internal layers of the arteries can become extremely severe, leading up to a occlusion. Um, I've seen one case since I've been doing ultrasound, and it was on a 16-year-old girl. Well, I hope you enjoyed this brief tutorial going over the, the protocol and anatomy of carotid arteries, as well as uh, some pathology. Um, I will be posting this in the Facebook and YouTube pages, as well as the blog, uh, with all the references and links. I'm Henry Suarez, and take care.